thanks for the intro, John. Um, and I think uh, also Andy's going to cover some of this as well about diversity in his talk. So uh, I think by the end of the, the day, hopefully we'll have covered some of this. Now, I'm supposed to be talking about, I say supposed to be, talking about the systems of systems approach to um, to, to, to PNT and uh, resilient PNT. I can only touch on it because it's a huge topic. It really is. So I'm only literally in half an hour going to touch on a few flavors of it and show you a few points and some of the aspects of it. Um, and hopefully it will be enough to get you thinking. Um, even just looking at this chart of typical GNSS vulnerabilities, you get an idea of how many things we have to consider. And if we um, go back to what John talked about first thing this morning, which is how accurate is my GPS receiver? You know, what, what we mean by accuracy, what does that mean? And we even start thinking about how things have come on. Up in the top left-hand corner is uh, a, an image from the uh, National Museum of American History, in the Smithsonian. That is a, a, a military GPS receiver. And actually, with that GPS handheld receiver on its own right there, you, you wouldn't really even start thinking about a systems to systems approach very much. You wouldn't need to as a user. Um, but see how things have evolved. You know, uh, we, we see a, a, a munitions, uh, a modern munitions receiver on the left hand side, bottom. And on the right hand side, an integrated digital flight deck, which, um, you, you know, suddenly you, you really are talking about a very complicated system. And to put that flight deck into, um, picture into perspective, um, you know, GPS now has become an integral part of the flight deck on an aircraft. And recently I, I was at a talk by a representative of the Airline Pilots Association who was giving evidence at a, at a review um, into out of band interference. And as he said, these days aircraft systems prioritize GPS use. It's used in instrument approaches and the terrain awareness and warning system in aircraft it was singled out, which gives them, um, you know, information on high terrain. It's critical in an emergency situation, like a loss of engine on takeoff. And, and they, you know, apparently it provides 11 levels of information to the pilots. Now, one of the, the things he mentioned, which I think is a, a great way of showing that when you start thinking about a systems to systems approach, you really do have to consider how the user uses this information. I didn't realize that the TORS system, the terrain and warning, awareness and warning system, actually um, provides the information which gives the flight deck automated call outs for monitoring and cross checks. And that's something you might not have thought about before. And, and that just shows how important it is to have a, a very holistic view of what you're doing when you're trying to make things better. Going back to that, that question about how accurate my GPS receiver is, I wanted to show again the complexity um, when we start trying to answer those questions or putting requirements on a GPS receiver, let alone um, you know, start to try and make it more resilient. This is a US government slide that talks about how accurate the GPS signals are on in, in, in space and on the Earth. And as they say, the, the measure must be combined with other factors outside the government's control. And there's a huge list here, satellite geometry, signal blockage, atmospheric conditions, receiver design features, quality. Um, but look at how accurate GPS is on, on, on Earth today. And you realize that one of the reasons um, that we have to pay so much attention um, to A, making things more resilient and B, using that system's viewpoint to do it, is that GPS has suddenly become ubiquitous. It's, it's embedded in society and in a lot of systems and in a lot of ways that we're not necessarily totally aware of. Again, this is another chart about um, how accurate the GPS receiver might be. This again is how accurate um, time timing is generated from GPS, and you know people talk about how you know GPS time from the atomic clocks on board the satellites is traced to UTC. That's not even straightforward, um, but they manage to control it 
in, in effect, to be accurate to the UTC from the US Naval Observatory to within um, less than 30 nanoseconds for 95% of the time. That's incredible, but you wouldn't get that performance um, in practice um, at, at your own terminal on, 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 on Earth. But this, this kind of shows how precise and accurate it is. And this is why, again, people use GPS as a very, very cheap way of getting very precise timing. And again, you know, that's another consideration to think about when we start thinking about use cases. Often, it's not the position that's the most important piece of PNT information that's used in systems. It's the time that's used in systems that you don't necessarily think use it. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this slide because I think John had a, had one as well that showed um, the, the, the error mechanisms. But I wanted to show that with some of them, um, you know, ante the antenna and the antenna electronics is a component that is, in, is as important as a receiver as well when you're receiving some of these things. Um, or, you know, when you're receiving GNSS signals, they pass through the ionosphere, the troposphere, you get multipath obstructions. We're going to look at interference as well, which is another part of the picture. And as John said, you know, um, you know that you, you have to um, firstly evaluate the risks. And, and I said as well to add to that, know your use case. And as John said, if you do this properly, a small thing, a small change in what you do can result in a big improvement in resilience. Um, and, uh, and, and I'm trying to illustrate that and we, we talk about it later on. Again, GNSS in modern society is, well, I think it's it's been an incredible transformation. We don't think about it very much now. <clears throat> and being involved in PNT today, um, it's very addictive. And one of the most addictive things about it for me, is finding out uh, something new about how it's used and where it's used and not being aware of it. Um, and that's often the case with timing. Um, you know, quite often the, the system becomes dependent on GPS generated timing without many of the users even knowing about it or even thinking or wondering where that information has come from. And that to me always means that you get unexpected and very complex system dependencies. So when you look at some of the unexpected impacts of GNSS disruption, <clears throat> this is why and how they happen, how they <clears throat> and how they happen. Now, here's a <clears throat> here's the diagram I like to show. Um, it, this is a, a the role of a GNSS receiver in a PNT system. And there are some blocks here that anyone, and, and this is, you know, a navigation system in, in specifically, but there are some some primary blocks here in any navigation system. You, you, you need to do some planning and that planning is, is perhaps a map. It's got environmental characteristics. Maybe it's even got forecasts involved as well. Then the second thing you have to do is you have to do some dead reckoning. If you set off for a walk, you know, when you start um, going, if you're going to a destination that you're not used to, perhaps you'll have to start thinking about what time you might want to arrive there. You might want to think about where you are on the pavement, how many roads you've got to cross. Do you know exactly where you are? Probably not. But the next block is a fixing block. And, and fixing is, is, if you like, it, it's uh, reconciling the position you think you are from the dead reckoning that you've done with a with an abs absolute with a confirmation um, and fixing is a GNSS part of, of what of PNT we're used to today but it doesn't have to be a GNSS sensor that provides a fix for us walking it would be a maybe a landmark so it might be vision for a connected vehicle it might be lidar um, and uh, for a, a cell phone it might actually be um, a Wi-Fi uh, but those three <clears throat> blocks, if you like, the planning, the dead reckoning and the fixing are part of any navigation system. And but what you do when you've got that, um, uh, if you like, that error calculation between your dead reckoning and the fixing, you have to correct it. So you have to estimate how far apart the fix 
and your dead reckoning um, are, and then you do something to compensate for it. And, you know, for us, when we're walking um, or, or driving a car, we compensate. We make inputs into a control and guidance system, which adjusts, adjusts our route or our velocity or our trajectory. Um, but often when you, um, you know, when people are thinking about PNT requirements, the, con the error correction part of this and the control guidance system don't get as much prominence as those other three blocks. And, um, and also often today, because GNSS is so ubiquitous, the dead reckoning block has been abandoned altogether um, in some systems and they're just relying on fixing. And you can see from this diagram that if you just rely on fixes in a navigation system, you're, you, you're, leaving, a, you're leaving yourself a problem. And the, and the same is true actually in timing systems because that dead reckoning block would be a holdover oscillator or something like that that, that tries to hold a, a timing source. Um, it's not quite dead reckoning, but it's an an analogous to it. And, um, and then you fix it or discipline it with a, with a, with a, a G, G, GPS fix. And the other thing that's quite interesting about this is that when you start looking at this, it starts to make sense. Then you start thinking that there, there's some latency in the reaction of that control and guidance system. And so in, in, in other words, that adjustment of the route or trajectory may not be quite in line with your dead reckoning and your fixing um, uh, uh, frequency. So in, in other words, the frequency of your of, the, of providing GPS fixes into your error engine might be totally negated by the response of the control and guidance system. So these are more systems aspects that we have to think about. And it's just, it's not just true for how the system works. It might even be true uh, about how you assess vulnerabilities. This is a real dynamic positioning system, which is used on a modern platform supply ship. And, and I think, um, I can't remember who it was asked the question about diversity of, of, of systems. And, and we'll be talking more about that later on in, in, in the sessions today. But this is just to show you that here, GNS is just, well, it's just two sensors. And, um, and, and if you like, we've got gyro inputs, wind sensors, motion sensors, and laser sensors. Um, and all of them are linked to controllers that, that guide and, and control the propulsion and steering systems on the ship. So, um, so for me, as a, as a, as a security technologist, you know, I'm, I'm firstly thinking, well, there's a lot of sensors there that could be attacked. Um, and secondly, you know, if GPS was jammed, what, what would happen? How does, how does the controller prioritize the GPS input compared to the others? Um, and, and there are all these sorts of questions, and, but you can see it becomes complicated. And, and that's not just an isolated system. This is a modern, uh, this is a modern ship's um, system, again, with two DGPS inputs and, um, and antennas here, an S-band and X-band antennas, loads of, of various workstations and systems on the ship. And most of them, most of them, are critically dependent on GNSS data for time as well as for any positioning data. And and and, and if you think that's not the case, we've um, got this. You know, there was a trial in 2010 uh, of the east coast of the UK, where um, where live jamming was tried out on a by the uh, by the uh, GLA General Lighthouse Authorities at the time. Um, their research and radio navigation um, division. They wanted to find out what um, the effects of real GPS jamming would be on on a, on a ship. So they sailed um, their um, their ship um, through uh, an area where they were uh, able to carry out some live jamming safely. And obviously, you know, there were things that were expected. We, it was expected that the GPS navigation system would go down, but the ship would be fine because it had lots of backup systems. And, um, you know, it, the, the, the trouble was that when the jammer power was turned up a little bit, um, a whole host of other systems on the ship 
um, decided not to work because they're all absolutely dependent on GPS time um, to function. Um, and no one knew that that was the case. So even the ship's radar and gyro compasses were inactive. Satellite voice and data comms stopped working. Um, and, and the autopilot as well. So, so everything um, pretty much on the ship stopped working when, when GPS um, jamming was, was there. And that, that just kind of shows that um, how difficult it is sometimes to uh, predict the results um, of, of of GPS disruption on 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 the dependent systems, and again, I'm just just showing you here that that when you, that, that also not only when you introduce other sensors and this diversity of sensors and um, engines that fuse the results from the sensors, not only is it does it become very complicated to figure out what's going on, but it also becomes complicated to um, from a resiliency point of view, because you need to understand all of the threat surfaces on those other inputs to the system as well. And that's not always straightforward. And what I often say to people now is it demonstrates the need for for, um, for GNSS vulnerabilities and, and resiliency in PNT to be integrated into the overall cybersecurity um, framework. For systems and because and, that, and that's clear from from this chart i think um you know achieving resilient pnt isn't easy it's it's not going to be easy um the one of the fathers of, of gps actually proposed a, a pta program which is is called pta protect toughen and augment and and i think this is a really good holistic framework for Making improvements and it it drives you uh, necessarily into a into a, a system of systems viewpoint. Uh, protection is about you know it could be about legislation, operational procedures such as um, protecting the radio spectrum. It could be um, you know legislating against interference and interfering devices. Um, it could be um, a, about um, you know pr producing uh, operational procedures, say for an airline that. Um, had uh, problems with GPS, it might be to um, take the crew's reliance off um, the TORS system for various things, for example, or it might be to cancel flights under certain circumstances. Um, toughening GPS receivers, I'll, I'll talk about that in a little while, and augmenting where you use other sources as well and other techniques. So GPS isn't your critical point of failure. And, you, you know, we know lots of critical infrastructures in the UK and in the US and elsewhere are critically dependent on GPS in one form or another. So it's, it becomes important. And then we've been talking about resilience, but you know what, what on earth does resilience mean? So when we start, um, start on this path to increasing resilience, you know, that systems engineering viewpoint means that we have to start drilling down into what the terms mean. And this is just, uh, for example, here, when we talk about resilience, we need both resist some sort of resistance against threats and as also recovery is important as well, for example. So this is just really just to illustrate the point that you have to start agreeing and um, and, and reaching a, a consensus on different terms. And to show how important this actually is, the, the resilience term, um, these are some tests we carried out um, with, with a, a, a partner, Calnex, um, in our labs in 2016. And, and this was actually, we were just looking at trying to spoof timing receivers. Um, we didn't think we'd be able to. For some reason, we thought that they would generate warning messages and stop us doing it. Um, because these are timing receivers that, are, that were in use at the time, still are probably today in various places. And as you can see, from these these um, these charts, we were able to get them to follow a ramp um, in terms of of time error, um, and most of the, most of the time they didn't generate any warning signals at all. But the interesting thing is here, you know, what how would you um, evaluate resilience in terms of these two tests? You know, it's challenging to get repeatable results. In the first test here, the receiver actually does more than recover. It recovers and then 
if you like, it carries on deviating after we turn the spoofer off. It, um, and in the second test, this receiver, again, doesn't look resilient at all. But if you had a systems of systems viewpoint, it, it actually came up with a couple of odd warning messages or odd messages, actually. They weren't really designed as warnings, but it, it told us and complained that it was in survey mode several times. And then here, it started to bring up some, some odd messages saying it was locked and in sync, but not GPS steered, although it carried on with uh, reporting the, the GPS time that it was generating. And over here again, but actually you might say that shows it's not resilient at all, but if you had this that second receiver connected, or, or the receiver in this case, connected to a, some systems that were dependent on it, those warnings might have been able to tell the dependent system to stop using um, you know, you know, the time that was being generated. So that's why you have to start thinking about that system's consideration. And it gets you to think about other factors, you know, um, as well. So we've got to think about, you know, how PNT is used in a in, in the target application area. What's the mission? What are the objectives of the mission? What are the likely threats? Well, John sort of talked about risk assessment um, and how you can use a, a quantitative risk assessment um, mechanism to, to determine that. And that, that's something that you need to do. What, what's the relevant legislation around it? Um, what are the business and operational functions that you're dependent on? The dependent systems we talked about. Yes, you need to know about the dependent systems. How did what do they use in terms of the PNT that comes out? And how do they use it? What's the data flow, and 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 actually how to measure any improvements that you try to make because that's not always straightforward either. And if you look at those factors, you know they they do absolutely show a good mapping onto this holistic uh, protect, toughen, and augment framework for GNSS. Um, narrowing that down a little bit um, and starting to think about the things we can usefully do in a, in a smaller system just to improve things a little bit or, or, or a great deal with a little change. Um, this is a chart that talks about the power of jammers in, in interference and, and if you like these lines all show a fixed power jammer they're plotted um, logarithmically for those um, who, who understand how these things work. Um, you, you don't need to understand too much about how the graph's generated. It's a very, it's a tool that's in wide use. And what the what's happening here is that it gives you a, 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 a amount of capability that you need to have in your receiver to resist jamming of a fixed power at a certain range. So, for example, here. Um, to have a look at if you wanted to resist a 100 uh, milliwatt jammer, um, this is a line of the power level of a 100 milliwatt jammer, and it shows using a propagation model the effect that it has. If you were 30 kilometers from the jammer, then this tells you the amount of anti jam capability you'd need in your receiver to combat that jammer. And, and similarly, if you wanted to then decrease that range to the jammer to 20 kilometers, um, you're reading off the 20 to the 100 milliwatt line, it tells you you need a little bit more um, anti-jam capability or mitigation there. Now, th this is based on free range propagation, so, um, so it's not as easy as that. But th this is where you would start, perhaps, with a tool to figure out what you might want to do to toughen a receiver. Um, these are the sort of tools that are widely available, and you can start thinking about things like this. Um, it's not going to protect you against the, these things on the right hand side here, which are big um, GPS jammers in action um, and they're Russian RF jammers. And, and it, it, you know, you're probably not going to protect yourself against that, but you could start thinking about, for example, how to protect yourself from personal protection devices, the small cigarette lighter type jammers, which would be down here at 10 milliwatts, even lower than that even. But it gives you an idea of how much you need to improve the situation from something that's unprotected and it might help. It's complicated, it's not easy. That tool will give you an indication and using something like that at least gives you some awareness of what you need to do. But then you start going back to our, um, you know, our issue about terms and what they mean um, 
you know, you'll see in, in, if you um, if you follow any of the um, interesting discussions about out of band interference in the US um, at the moment, you know, there's a, a big discussion about what what is meant by harmful interference. And um, if you like, some people have defined this. In fact, the US Air Force defined an interference protection criterion being a one dB drop in carry to noise ratio. And that's been widely used um, by lots of agencies in the US for a long time and worldwide. Um, it's ended up being a worldwide standard and turned into this, uh, what they call the IPC. However, another definition of harmful interference might be, as shown in the bottom chart, is when the GPS receiver starts to show horizontal position error um, uh, uh, errors getting out of control, like in this chart here. Um, and down here, this receiver starts to deviate down here towards this side of the chart. And the question is, which which um, you know which definition is right? Well, if you had a look at um, at the interference protection criteria, the one dB drop in carry to noise ratio, <clears throat> you'd find that the one dB drop in carry to noise ratio happens before. Um, a receiver starts to exhibit errors in its positioning. And that always seems to be true. That's always true. So you could see that if you wanted a good metric for yourself um, to figure out what was going on, and the 1 dB drop in carry to noise ratio is the sort of thing that would tell you um, that, that something untoward is likely to happen to the receiver. Whereas harmful um, interference, if you take it to be an error in positioning in a receiver, that's going to be very difficult to be consistent. However, those two definitions are in, in wide use in various quarters, and you'd have to think about what they mean and what they mean to your design. Also, to complicate matters even further, we have to think about how a receiver operates. Again, the US Air Force did a lot of work here, and, and they defined various states of operation. You, know, you don't have to remember all these. Um, it's not vital, but the, the, the interesting bit is up here where you have acquisition. In other words, when a receiver is trying to lock on to the signal for the first time to start up, um, it can be more vulnerable and is more vulnerable than it is when it's actually tracking a signal. And, and an interesting thing here is you can see there's a thing called direct acquisition. Um, and direct acquisition is for receivers that uh, military receivers that start up on the GPS L2 frequency. Um, and you might ask yourself why that's um, why that's uh, defined. It's defined because it's unusual for receivers to not acquire using L1 CA code. So quite often you will find multi-band, multi-frequency, if you like, multi-constellation receivers that need to acquire on the GPS L1 frequency. And if you find a receiver like that, it's a multi-constellation, multi-frequency receiver that needs to start up using L1CA code, then obviously that they can be more vulnerable to just an L1CA jammer. So um, again, you know, you have to um, you, you have to understand some of these um, subtleties as well. Um, but there's lots of things we can do for mitigation. Um, you know, and multi-constellation, multi-frequency might be okay under some circumstances. We saw how they could be used to negate ion, ionospheric uh, um, or solar weather. Um, we can do things like active notch filtering. That works very well for filtering out interference and narrow frequency bands, but it can introduce biases. You can improve the DSPN logic. In a lot of receivers today, that's been the case, the, the digital side of things has been improved and they can, you know, that can be configured to detect, can provide warnings. We have a, an, an, an acronym called RAIM here. It's receiver, RAIM stands for Receiver Autonomous Integrity Monitoring. And that basically means that the receiver can detect errors or problems with the signals it's receiving um, through the set of algorithms and do something about it. It can either detect a fault and warn about it or exclude um, signals that aren't up to quality. Um, we have fire, firewalls today and the RF front end. Uh, I'm going to, um, not, I don't want to talk too much about the antennas and the, the basics of antennas, but actually you can improve things very 
with a small in a small way you can improve things with a better antenna i think that's the the, the thing to do and, and even breaking line of sight with an interference source can give you an improvement as well and um and another thing would be literally just improving separation from the jammer these are three small things you can do to make a small uh you know small change that could make a big improvement to um any experiences of, um of, of interference or disruption um the antenna can be a small um, improvement like a choke ring antenna or it can be a a more sophisticated bit of te technology like these military examples which aren't available in the commercial dom domain today these are all military adaptive antennas um, and they're in wide 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 use today they provide very very effective um, mitigation against gps jamming for the systems that depend on them um, they, they use beam forming and null forming to provide very high levels of protection um, you know with, with adaptive antennas um, you know they, 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 if you want a summary of the technologies used you know it's the null steering null steering which is basically st steering a negative antenna gain or null toward the source of any interference that it detects um, they can steer the beam so that it provides maximum gain towards um, authentic satellite signals. And they use a technique called space-time um, frequency uh, adaptive processing, which is called STAP or SFAP, which are both more less widely used acronyms. And, um, and so the antenna technology has moved on as well and can be used. And it can make a big difference but unfortunately in the commercial domain we're not um, able to access as widely some of the military technologies but i think it, it goes to show that the antenna is as important as the receiver when we start talking about how to improve or mitigate um, systems and and i think overall that you know talking about how to use the systems and systems approach to um, practical mitigation um, I've, I've only been able to touch on a few small aspects of it in this talk but it's it's all about understanding things you have to understand the mission um, understand the, the use of the pnt within your with the business um, within the the application understand independencies understand where the data goes how it's collected where, it, where it's stored um, doing the risk assessment um, figuring out what the consequences are of an attack getting through that's often not done um, and they can be unexpected as well and you know and absolutely integrating in a, in a cyber security network and then it's all about finding out then what the best measures are the most cost effective measures um, you, that there are out there that you can take and developing those measures of success and then you have to repeat it all and I, I don't think there are any surprises in the insights. Resilience has to be considered right from the start. Um, you have to understand what that means. So it's all about withstand or recover or elements of both. Have to totally understand the threat environment for you. Um, resilience in a system is very complex and it's heavily threat dependent. Um, you need to test the system. You need to know what happens if and when a threat gets through, because you have to safeguard against that, know what could go wrong. You have to know your system dependencies and you have to know how long your system will carry on providing adequate performance if GNSS is denied um, or totally disrupted. So, uh, so that's just a flavor of some of the things that we have to think about, I think. Um, so with that, I shall stop sharing and hand back.